If you went out and you asked 100 different people, what is your biggest monthly expense? 90 of them are gonna say it's the housing payment, your mortgage or your rent. But did you know there's a little loophole out there that you can use which lets you own your own home, but you don't actually have to make a housing payment out of your pocket? Watch this video till the end to find out how. What's up everybody, I am Jasprit Singh from TheMinorityMindset.com and welcome to The Minority Mindset. Most people's biggest expense is their house because every month you gotta pay this rent check or this mortgage check. But what if there was a way for you to live without a housing payment and without having to wait 30 years to pay off your mortgage? Yes, it is possible and I'm gonna be talking about it in this video, but before I get into that, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash that thumbs up button below because the way the YouTube algorithm works, if you do not smash that thumbs up button, then uh, YouTube is much less likely to show you and other people our financial news and education videos. To do this kind of house hacking, you have to find a loophole in the system. What's considered a home? Before you give me a sentimental answer like home is where the heart is, we're talking strictly financial right now, okay? When most people think of a home, here's what they're thinking. They're thinking of this building with a roof on it, with a door, with a couple windows, actually maybe more windows, and then a driveway. This is what most people think of when they think of a home. But technically speaking, that's not the only definition of a home. I mean, you can own a condo, which is one unit, which is attached to a lot of different units. Your home can be an apartment, where now you're renting this one unit inside of a building with a bunch of different units. Your home can also be a mobile home. So there's a lot of different types of homes out there. And if you wanted to buy a home, this takes a lot of cash. And most people don't just have a ton of cash sitting in the bank account where they can just go and buy their own home completely with cash. So what do you do? You go over to the bank and then the bank is gonna loan you some money that way you have the cash to buy a home. So now the bank gives you this mortgage that way you have the cash to buy this home and then every month for the next 30 years after that you're gonna be paying your bank back this mortgage plus a little bit of interest. So this is what people want to avoid. They don't want to have this big monthly payment because it is expensive and for the majority of people when they think of being this housing payment free they have to wait 30 years until they can pay off their mortgage. But there's a little loophole that you can use which will allow you to no longer have this money come out of your personal bank account. You could have someone else pay this loan. Let me show you what I mean. So you have this really nice four unit multifamily building on sale for a million dollars and each one of these units rent for $2,000 a piece. They're pretty nice units, they're spacious, they're nice. When most people think of buying this four unit multifamily building, here's what they think. I'm gonna buy this multifamily building for a million dollars, but I don't have a million dollars in the bank, so now I gotta go to the bank and get this commercial real estate loan, that way I have the cash to buy this investment property. So you go to the bank, the bank's gonna say, hey, you wanna buy this property? Great, put down $200,000, and then we, the bank, are gonna loan you $800,000, and because it's a commercial real estate loan, we're gonna charge you something around six percent a year in interest. If you're getting a commercial real estate loan, a business loan, it's going to cost you a whole lot more than a regular mortgage, which is why at this time it might be something around six percent interest, which means this eight hundred thousand dollars that you're borrowing is going to cost you as the investor forty eight hundred dollars a month. This is how much money you're going to be paying the bank every single month to own this four unit building that you're renting out. At first glance you might think, wow that's a great deal. You're making two thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, that's eight thousand dollars a month in rent and you're only paying forty eight hundred dollars to your bank. That's thousands of dollars of margin. Except you forgot property taxes and property insurance and maintenance fees and management fees and property vacancies. Those five fees that I just mentioned are probably going to cost you something around $2,500 a month. This is in addition to your mortgage payment that you have to make every single month, your loan payment. So when your property is full, you'll be making $8,000 a month in revenue, and then you have to subtract your costs, which $4,800 plus $2,500, something around $7,300. $100 a month, which leaves you with a few hundred dollars of margin every single month to put in your pocket. And this can cover your vacancies that might come up and put some money in your pocket. But in this particular situation, you don't have a place to live. So now you're going to have to go out and find another home to live in yourself. And you're going to have to make a rent payment or a mortgage payment. And chances are this money that's left over after paying off whatever vacancies come up is not going to be enough to cover your entire mortgage payment and your entire rent payment. So now let's reanalyze this deal. But this time you're going to do something different. This time instead of renting this property out to four different families, you're going to rent it out to three different families and you are going to live in this unit right here for yourself. Remember when I asked you in the beginning of this video what is a home? Well, from a legal perspective as an attorney who is not your attorney, I can tell you that your home, which is called your primary residence, it can be a one unit, 
a two unit, a three unit, or a four unit property. So now if you go out and you buy this four unit multifamily building and you don't rent out all four units, you live in one of the units and you rent out the other three. Now this is a four unit building that you are using as your primary residence, your home. When you use this house hacking loophole, there are four things that happen for you. First, you get a much cheaper loan because now you're buying a home and you can get a primary home mortgage instead of going out and getting a commercial business loan. At the time of me recording this video, this might only cost you 3% a year in interest. Compare that to what you would have to pay if you got the commercial loan like I talked about earlier. So now if you wanted to buy the same $1 million property and you put down $200,000, now your monthly mortgage payments are going to drop from $4,800 a month to $33. $73 a month. That's quite a big drop. $3,400 a month might sound steep depending on your income, but you have to remember one more thing. Your neighbors, your people attached to your building are all going to be paying you $2,000 a month to live in your building each. All right, now check this out. So $2,000, $2,000, $2,000. Every single month, your neighbors are going to be sending you $6,000 a month when your property is full. But you got some costs that you have to pay, right? First thing you're gonna do is you have to pay your bank. You're paying your bank $33.73 a month. And then you also have your regular building expenses, right? Your property taxes, your maintenance, your management fees, your vacancy costs, whatever this is, right? You have your regular cost to have a building, have a home. And this is gonna cost you from the previous example, $2,500 a month. This leaves you with $127 every single month that you have all your tenants in there after paying your mortgage, after paying all of your housing payments, your taxes, your maintenance, everything for your home, you still have another $127 in your month because your neighbors are so generous that they decided to pay your mortgage for you. You get to live mortgage free because you don't have a housing payment anymore. Your neighbors are paying it for you. You're putting an extra $125 in your pocket every single month and your neighbors are helping you build equity in this million dollar property every single month and none of this equity is being built by you. It's being paid for by your neighbors. But now what if you don't want to pay that $200,000 down payment or what if you don't have that $200,000 down payment? Well, that brings me to the second advantage of this loophole. This is where alternative types of financing come into play, like FHA loans. If you go the FHA loan route, now you might only have to put down 3.5% on your loan, but the issue with FHA loans is there's a limit to how big of a home that you can buy. But the interesting thing here is if you buy a multi-unit property, like a four-unit home like I talked about, because four units count as a home, then the FHA limit increases. But before I get into that, let me also remind you that more debt comes with more risk. If you're only putting 3.5% down, you don't have as much skin in the deal, and you have bigger multi-mortgage payments. And so just understand that more debt comes with more risk, and if you don't have a big enough equity in your property, then you're also going to have to pay PMI but it is an option for some people who want to get into this house hacking game. In certain areas, you would be allowed to buy this four unit property with just three and a half percent down with an FHA loan, which means you only have to put down $35,000 and now you have this four unit property that you're renting out to three other people. Now in this situation, your mortgage payments are going to jump to $4,000 a month. Okay, let's do the math. 2,000, 2,000, 2,000. You have $6,000 coming into your pocket every month from your tenants. And then the first thing you got to do is you got to pay the bank $4,000. So you pay the bank $4,000 and then you have to pay the additional $2,500 a month to live, manage the property, you know, property taxes and everything else. That means every single month out of your pocket, you're going to have to pay $500 to live here. But you also have a million dollar property that you're building equity in each and every month. And most of that is being paid by your tenant. And in this situation, you only had to pay $35,000 down to buy this million dollar property. The third benefit, remember I said there's four, the third benefit is that now you can sell this property for a profit and not pay any taxes. If I, just put it saying, the real estate investor come in and I buy this property to rent out. So now I'm not living here, I'm renting out all four units and I rent it out for a year and a year goes by and I realize, ooh, I can sell this property for $1.2 million and now I sell this property for $1.2 million. Hey, I made $200,000 in a year, which is great, 
but I gotta pay taxes on that $200,000 of profits. These $200,000 of profits of selling this investment property are called long-term capital gains, and so I'm gonna have to pay taxes on $200,000, and so I'm only gonna keep a fraction of that. But when this is your home, remember, this is your personal residence, which means this is your home. You can do that if you have four units. So if this is your home, you have a special tax exemption which says you can sell your home for a up to $250,000 profit and you don't have to pay any taxes. And if you own the home as a married couple, then you can sell your home for up to a $500,000 profit, which means you could sell this home for $1.5 million and then you wouldn't have to pay a penny in profit. But sticking with the example, if you buy this home and you live here and then you can have your tenants, your neighbors, pay you rent every single month and now your neighbors are paying for your mortgage. They're building you equity in your home and now if you sell this property, your home for $1.2 million, you lived in this home free, you built equity free thanks to your neighbors and now you can sell this property and walk away with a couple hundred thousand dollars cash in your pocket. And yes, that's tax free. And then the fourth benefit is you can do something that I like to call multi-level house hacking. At the time of me recording this video, most lenders have a rule that you are not allowed to rent out your primary residence unit. So if you buy this property, you can buy it as a home, your own personal residence, but you're not allowed to rent out your unit for at least 12 months. But after 12 months, you typically have the right to turn this unit into a rental unit as well. So now you move out and now you just got this new rental unit. Remember, if I bought this property initially as an investment property, I'd be paying 6% interest. I'd have to put $200,000 down and my monthly payments would be $4,800 a month. But if I buy this property as my own home and I live here for a year, remember, I can get this at a 3% mortgage. I can still put down $200,000, but now my monthly payments are gonna be something like, what was it, $3,400, something like that a month. And now I can live here for a year, not have to pay any housing payments because my neighbors are paying for everything, put $100 into my pocket every month, and then a year later, I can move out and then put an additional $2,000 into my pocket every month because these three tenants are paying the mortgage, they're paying all the housing bills, they're paying for everything else. This tenant is just profit after I move out. So now this new property where I just moved out of can keep paying me the $2,000 a month every single month because now your interest rate doesn't change. Your bank is gonna let you keep this 3% interest rate which you're not allowed to get if you're buying it as an investment property. But here's the dilemma. If you move out of this property, you still need a place to live, right? So you lived in this property for a year. You didn't have to make any housing payments because your neighbors paid it for you. You built equity in this property. And then a year and a day later, you move out, you bring in a new tenant. And so you're putting another couple thousand dollars in your pocket, but you need a place to live. So here's what you can do. Now you find another property like this, another four unit property. And guess what? You start this process all over Again, all right, let me just finish drawing the windows. I drew the door knob before the door. All right, now you have four new units, and now guess what? You move here, you rent out these three units to your neighbors. Each of these neighbors are paying you $2,000 a month, and you start this process again. There's no limit to how many times you do this. And every single year, you can buy a new property, you can let your neighbors pay your mortgage, and you can continue building equity in more and more investment properties. Do this system five times, and now you have five different investment properties with very low interest rate debt that are making you a profit every single month, that you're building equity on every single month, that your neighbors are paying for you to live there for every single month. Oh, and after five of them, you also have $10,000 coming into your pocket as profit every single month through passive income. I know it's a lot easier said than done, but this process is possible and it's a very accessible way for you to go and get involved in real estate because now you are having your own property where you're living in, but you're also building these rental streams and when you're ready, you can move out and do it again. What's up everybody, I am Jasparit Singh and if you own a home and you're trying to figure out what do I do with my extra cash? Should I save it? Should I put my money in the market or should I use my extra cash to pay down the mortgage on my home? Well, in this video, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break down what is the best investment for you depending on what your goals are and financially what is the best thing for you to do if you should pay down your home because there are some benefits to paying down your home and there are also some cons to paying down your home. So let's dive right into it. The first thing that you want to understand is kind of where in the home ownership cycle that you're in because when you go and get a mortgage, let's assume that you get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, your mortgages are front-loaded, meaning 
that your payments that you're making in the early part of your mortgage are going primarily into the bank's pockets in terms of interest and their profits, and you have a teeny tiny little bit going to pay off your actual principal, meaning the home balance on your loan. And so what happens is for the first half of your mortgage, the first almost 15 years or so, you have more of your monthly payment going into your bank's pockets for interest than actual paying down your principal. Let me actually dive a little bit deeper and show you. I'm on bankrate.com. You can try this out for yourself, but I put a loan amount of half a million dollars at a 30-year loan term at a 6% interest rate, and I'm going to assume that the loan starts on January 2023. That way it's easy for calculations. And if you just look at this chart, what you'll see is this dark blue line shows the amount of money that you're paying in principal, and the light blue line is the interest. And if you start the mortgage in 2023, it isn't until, where is this, October of 2036 until more of your payment is going towards your principal balance rather than your interest paid. Now, it goes a little bit more interesting if you go into this next tab, which is the schedule. And what you'll see here is that in 2023, in the 12 months of you paying your mortgage of about $3,000 a month, only $5,600 is going to pay down your principal balance, while $27,361 is going directly into your bank's pocket of interest. Meaning, you paid over $32,000 over the course of 2023, and only $5,600 went to actually pay down the balance of your home. Now, while this information might not be a determining factor of whether or not you should pay down your home or not, it might give you a little bit of a fire under your butt to realize that, oh my God, a lot of my money is going directly into my banker's pocket, and if I do pay down my home faster, well, then I can help build my equity in my home without just making my banker so rich. Because if you pay down your home faster, you have less interest going into your banker's pocket. But now the question is, what happens now if I invest my money instead? Well, yeah, maybe I'm still putting my money in my banker's pocket, but if I can put more money into my pocket by investing my money myself, then it's worth it. Because if I have to put $10,000 into my banker's pocket in terms of interest, but I can make $20,000 from my investing, well, I can just take 10 grand from my investing profits, give it to the bank, and I still have $10,000 left for myself, so you end up a winner. So the question is now, can you get a better return on your money by not investing your money into paying down your mortgage and investing your money in yourself? Now, the calculation here is relatively straightforward. If the interest rate from your home is less than the interest rate from your investment, then it makes sense for you to invest your money, get a better return, and then use your profits to pay down your home mortgage because now you can do it at a profit because now, yeah, you're paying interest to your banker, but you're making more money from investments. The problem here is that here, investing your money also comes with the R word, which is risk. Because while the average stock market return is 10% a year historically, and the average real estate return is also right around 10% a year, that doesn't mean that the stock market and the real estate market are guaranteed to go up by 10% every single year. It's an average, meaning some years the markets go down. Some years they go up higher than 10% a year, and if you look at it over the long term, you're making 10% a year. But if you don't have that sort of investing experience, you might not see that same 10% return. Maybe you get a lower return. And this is where that risk factors in because you can also lose your money by investing your money. So if you're losing money by investing your money, but you could have gotten a guaranteed return by paying off your mortgage, well, then you're losing. Because when you pay off your home, it is a guaranteed return. If you're paying 5% a year on your mortgage or 6% a year or 4%, it doesn't really matter what you're paying and you pay off your mortgage one year early, well, that's a guaranteed return on your money versus here, there's no guarantee. However, here, you could potentially get higher returns, but it's not guaranteed. Now, the question is, how do you find the right answer for you? And this is gonna depend now more on your financial goals and on your risk tolerance. Because if your financial goals are, I just want to be free, I don't wanna to have to worry about money, I don't want to have to stress about money. I want to live small. I just want to be able to live my life and never have to think about money again. Well, you don't have to take on a whole bunch of risk then. Because if you can pay off your home quicker, well, now the biggest expense that you probably have is going to be paid off. And now you only have to worry about your property taxes. And you don't have to worry about paying a mortgage ever again. If on the other side you say, you know, I don't really care about risk. 
I want to live bigger. I want to live large. I want to live lavish. I want to have all the nice things. I want to have all the nice stuff. But then you got to be willing to take on more risk. And if you want to take on more risk, that means maybe it's better for you to invest this difference, invest the extra money instead of paying down your mortgage, because paying down your mortgage might give you a three to four to five, maybe 6% return on your money if you pay it off early. But if you invest your money, there's a lot more potential return there. And now you can try to get better returns, try to earn more money. That way, now you have more money to pay down this. Now, of course, is it riskier? Yes, but now you have to understand that the risk needs to match your goals. Because if you say, I wanna live large, I wanna have all these nice things, but I don't wanna take on any risk. Well, now you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. You wanna have the nice stuff, but you're not willing to put in the work or take the risk to do that. And so you have to understand kind of where it is in your life that you wanna be and what your goals are, because that's gonna dictate what you do next. Now, one thing that I do wanna point out here is if you have other sorts of debt, things like credit card debt, things like your home equity lines of credit, these are higher interest rate debts, then it would be more beneficial for you to pay that off instead of just paying off your mortgage because when you're paying off your 16% interest rate credit card, well, that's a guaranteed 16% return on your money. Here, when you invest your money in stocks or real estate, the average return is 10% a year. But when you're paying 16% to your credit card company, that is a guaranteed 16% return for your credit card company but you're the one that's paying that. So it's more beneficial for you to pay off these high interest rate debts instead of investing your money and instead of paying off your home because your home mortgage, I'm assuming now, is under 16% a year. If you have a mortgage that's costing you more than 16%, we have a problem and we gotta talk about something else here. But if you have a normal mortgage rate, this is where you have to understand what are the bigger debts and you wanna be paying off that credit card debt as fast as possible. Now the counter argument could potentially be, but Jasprit, we're talking about the home that I live in. If I don't pay off my home, well then I could risk potentially losing my home. If I don't make my home payments on my credit card, I could just declare bankruptcy on. Now, if you don't have the money to make the minimum payments on your home or your credit card, uh, this is where you need to get an advisor ASAP. That way you can figure out what you need to do, whether it's an attorney or an accountant, because now you wanna make sure that you can take care of your family and your finances and you need to know what your options are ASAP, because yeah, you don't wanna lose your home. And you also don't wanna get defaulted on by a credit card company. So that is a different situation. But if we're talking about the general now, if you have extra cash, you put that money towards your credit card or towards your home, put that money towards your credit card, pay the high interest rate off, and now we can talk about home versus an investment. And the answer here, yeah, is the return that you can get, but secondly, is the lifestyle that you wanna live. Now, if you do wanna make that decision that you wanna pay off your home early because you don't wanna ever have to stress about payments again because nobody likes making payments. I hate making payments. If you don't like the idea of making payments and you wanna pay off your home early, great. Now, what you have to understand next is that when you make your extra payment to your bank, to your lender, you wanna make sure that the extra money that you're putting towards your mortgage is being applied to your principal balance and it's not being used to pay off your next month or your next payment for your loan balance because these two things are gonna give you two completely different results. Because if you use your extra money, if you have an extra five grand, for example, and you use this money to pay off your next month's balance or your next balances, well now what's happening is you're just prepaying your next month's bill and then the next payment you make is just gonna be going towards the following month, which means that this $5,000 that you're paying is gonna be going partially into the bank's pocket and partially to pay down the principal balance. And instead, what you want to have happen is all $5,000 that you're investing back into paying down your home is going towards paying down your principal balance and none of it going into the bank's pocket. So if you're gonna pay down your home early and you're sending in some extra money to the bank, make sure you do it as a separate payment and make sure it is clear that this money that you're giving to the bank, to the lender, is going to pay down the principal balance entirely and none of it is going to interest. So if you're paying it online, there should be an option there. If you're sending in a check, make sure you send it in as a separate check. Talk to the lender, talk to them, make a note, let them know that you want all of this money going directly towards your principal balance and it's not going to interest. I can't emphasize this enough because it will make a big difference in how much money you pay overall and you wanna bring down the principal balance as fast as possible because as soon as the principal balance starts to go down, the amount of interest that you'll be paying will also go down so it'll save you more money over the long run as long as you are paying down your principal balance faster. Now if your question here is, okay, I kinda like the idea of both, maybe you put some money towards paying down your home faster but you also want to to invest your money. This is where now the more financially educated you are, the better returns that you 
you can get. And this is where now you can build real wealth because now you're building equity, you're building investments, you're building assets that can pay you. And now you own these assets, which are now paying for your lifestyle. But this requires you to have the right financial education. Now, if you're looking for an easy way to start learning, we have a free guide on passive income that you can read, which will go over how do you invest your money, even if you don't have a lot of money, how can you start generating passive income? How do you put your money to work? So if you want to read this guide, it is completely free. And I'll put the link to how you can download this passive income, passive investing guide down in the description below. But this is where now you have to understand the different ways that you can invest your money. And I'm just going to start by talking about me because it might help you understand the different options that you have because there are five places that I invest my money. I invest my money into my own business and startups. So I have a company called Market Briefs and I invest my capital, my cash into this company because I want to build this into a bigger financial media company. Second, I invest my money into real estate. I talked about in previous videos how I invest my money into real estate for cash flow. Right now I'm going to buy houses, single family homes, I buy apartment complexes, not for the purpose for me to live in myself, but for me to rent out to other people that right now it's providing me consistent cash flow. I also invest my money into stocks. So now I'm investing my money into individual companies. I'm investing my money into ETFs, which are funds, which will now I buy for appreciation because I believe in the economy. I believe in the long-term health. I believe in the long-term growth of the economy and I want a piece of that. The stock market allows me to do that. Fourth, I invest my money into cryptocurrency. I look at cryptocurrency less as a meme opportunity just to try to flip things and make a quick profit. I look at it as the future of money, the future of property, and the future of technology. I think there's a lot of value in the blockchain and the things that it can do. And I look at it as a software. So I invest in it for that purpose. And I also invest in physical gold, which is the fifth place to invest my money. And when I invest in physical gold, I'm not really trying to get a return on my money per se. I'm investing in physical gold as an alternative to saving money because the physical gold provides a better store of value than my cash does because cash can be printed. You can create more inflation, which dilutes the value of cash versus gold has to be mined. It takes time, effort, and labor to mine a physical ounce of gold. And so I know that this gold isn't producing more value, but for me, it's a better hedge against inflation. And it's kind of like insurance against the worst case scenario. So those are the different ways that I invest my money. And now this is where you can start to understand there are many different ways for you to invest. It's not just putting your money into ETFs. It's not just putting your money into the market. There are a lot of different ways for you to invest and each different investment opportunity can provide different returns depending on which phase of the market cycle that you're in. Now, I'm not a trader, I'm a long-term investor, and I understand that some of these asset classes will do better in certain economic cycles than others. But I also understand that it took me a long time to understand how to invest my money. It took me a lot of mistakes, it took me a lot of years, it took me a lot of books, it took me a lot of education, I took a lot of courses. And this is where, if you're just getting started, you want to start investing in your own education. This could be reading books, taking classes, but then also the experience because you cannot just ignore this experience. That experience is the best teacher. Making mistakes is one of the best things that you can do because you're gonna learn very quickly when you lose your own money. And when you lose your own money, you're gonna to wanna to learn how you never do that again. So it's gonna put some fire on you to learn how to invest your money better. But this is where now understanding the different ways that you can invest your money and start educating yourself, whether it's through books, YouTube videos, podcasts, classes, or actual education by doing it yourself. It's by putting in the education and putting in the reps by learning that way now as you become a better investor, it's much easier for you to get better returns because now you're better educated and you can find the opportunities a whole lot easier. For most people, your home is the biggest purchase you are ever going to make. That's why you want to make sure you're getting a mortgage the right way. And in this video, I'm going to be going over everything you need to know about getting a mortgage the right way. Buying a home is exciting and it's a big deal, but the process isn't always straightforward. You got to deal with real estate agents, bankers, title companies, property inspectors, and because homes are so expensive, if you don't know what you're doing, you could end up way overpaying. I've seen real estate from a lot of different angles because I used to be a real estate agent, I'm a real estate investor, and I'm an attorney. Now, I'm not gonna go over the steps on how to actually buy a home in this video. I already made a video on YouTube where I went over how to do that exactly. If you wanna watch that video, I will link it for you in the description below. But in this video, I wanna go over the things you need to understand about getting a mortgage. If you wanna buy a $400,000 home, chances are you don't got 400 grand just sitting at the bank that you can use to buy that home 
home. So you're going to work at the bank to get a mortgage. That way you can actually buy the home. But you want to make sure you're not getting taken advantage of by your bank. There's five things you want to make sure you understand when you're getting a mortgage. And I'm going to go over all five of these things in this video. So make sure you watch this video until the end. But before I get into that, I need you to do me a quick favor and mortgage that thumbs up button below. Before you go out and actually start looking at homes and making an offer, the first thing you want to do is get pre-qualified and get prepared to actually getting a mortgage. All getting pre-qualified means is that you've worked with a lender or a banker to get the basic credit process done. That way the bank or lender can see if they're willing to give you a loan. If you're not pre-qualified, you don't look like a serious buyer because I can tell you from personal experience, it is a major headache working with somebody who's not pre-qualified because if you fall in love with a home and you put an offer and it gets accepted and now you have to kind of get pre-qualified and get approved to get a mortgage and you can't do that, it is a major hassle because now you're wasting your time, you're wasting your real estate agent's time and you're wasting the seller's time. I was selling an apartment complex that I was a part owner of and a lady brought an offer to me. The problem was she was not pre-qualified, but she gave me a pretty good offer. Now, the real estate agent I was working with kept saying, oh, don't worry, just breathe. She has a lot of money. She's really successful. She'll have no problem getting a loan. So I thought, okay, fine, I'll let this one go. So now we're in contract. I take my property off market and a month goes by, she couldn't get approved for a loan. Two months go by, she couldn't get approved for a loan. Four months go by and she could not get approved for a loan. At this point, we had to cancel the deal and I had taken the property off market for four months and it was just a huge waste of time on my part, on my real estate agent's part and her part. As soon as you get pre-qualified, you automatically have an edge over other buyers who are not pre-qualified because if I'm selling a home and I get two offers, one is from somebody who's pre-qualified and one is from somebody who's not pre-qualified and you're pre-qualified and your offer is slightly lower than this person I'm still gonna take your offer even though it's less money because it's less headache and less uncertainty because you've already gotten pre-qualified. Part of the pre-qualification process is you getting prepared to actually get a mortgage because, well, getting a mortgage is kind of a difficult process. You're essentially kind of selling yourself to the bank and you wanna show the bank why you're a good investment for their money because if you can show the bank that you're a good investment, they will reward you with a lower interest rate. First, you gotta show the bank your proof of income. So you might need to show your tax returns, your W-2s, your 1099s, whatever income that you have at least for two years steadily you need to show this to the bank that way the bank can see that you're making money consistently second you want to show the bank any assets you might have so maybe you own some real estate investments or stock market investments or other assets you want to show this to the bank so you can show the bank what you have third the bank is going to want to know what debt you have and how much debt you have your debt to income ratio is literally just a fraction where banks look at how much debt you're making and they divide it by your income so nowadays banks typically like to see a debt to income ratio of less than 36%. So they wanna see that your debt is less than 36% of your income, and out of this 36%, they typically don't wanna see more than 28% for your mortgage. So this is how much your mortgage should be, max, and the rest of it can be your credit card debt, your car loans, or whatever. This is how much banks ideally wanna see, but sometimes you'll see banks stretch this total debt to income ratio from 36% up to 43%. So if you have a lot of outstanding debt, credit card debt, car loans, it's gonna be harder for you to qualify for a mortgage, so you need to work right now to pay down that debt, that way you can lower your debt to income ratio. The fifth thing your bank or lender is gonna look at is your credit score. You can get approved for a mortgage with a credit score of 620 or higher, but if you have a 620 credit score, you're gonna have to pay a lot more fees and a lot higher interest rate because the bank's gonna look at you like a riskier investment. If you wanna get the best interest rates and not pay these extra fees, you wanna have a credit score of at least 760 or above. If you're looking for ways to boost your credit score, you can use a credit card strategically and you can work to pay your bills on time. The second thing you need to understand about mortgages are the different kinds of mortgages out there because not all mortgages are created the same. First, let's talk about the differences between a fixed rate mortgage and an adjustable rate mortgage, an ARM. So fixed rate mortgages are are very straightforward. If you go to the bank and tell them you want a loan, they might say, all right, this mortgage is gonna cost you 2.8% a year, and if you agree to that for the next 30 years, you're gonna be paying 2.8% a year in interest on your mortgage, and that's it. It's not gonna change. Whether interest rates go up or down, this is the interest rate you are going to pay, and you have a set monthly payment. With an adjustable rate mortgage, it's not like that. With an ARM, the amount of money you're gonna pay on your mortgage is gonna change depending on what interest rates are. So one type of ARM that became very popular during the 2008 crash was the 228 ARM. What that means is during the first two years of your mortgage, you're gonna have a very low introductory teaser interest rate. So during the first two years, your monthly mortgage payments are very low. Then after that, your interest rate is gonna change every two years depending on what interest rates are. So if interest rates go up, then your mortgage payments are gonna go up 
and that's going to change every two years for the next 30 years. So you don't know what your mortgage payment is going to look like in five years or 10 years because you don't know what interest rates are going to be. If interest rates go up, your mortgage payments can go up. Another example of this is the five to one arm. What this means is during the first five years of your mortgage, your interest rate is fixed. And then every year, every one year after that, your mortgage rate is going to change depending on what interest rates are. And then the five by five arm says that during the first five years of your mortgage, your interest rate is not going to change. But then every five years after that, your interest rate is going to change depending on what interest rates are. Arms can be good when you're in an interest rate environment where you think interest rates are going to go down. But right now, we are in one of the lowest interest rate periods in history. It doesn't make sense to get an arm when interest rates are already lower than they've ever been. In the future, the only way interest rates can go are up unless we go negative interest rates. But even then, we're already seeing the lowest interest rates in history and we saw what happens if you tie yourself into an arm and then interest rates go up because that's exactly what happened in the 2008 crash. Everybody was getting into these 228 arms thinking that they were getting this amazing low teaser rate for the first couple of years. And then real estate prices came down and people couldn't refinance. And now everybody's mortgage payments were way higher than they anticipated. So people started foreclosing left and right. So arms can be good hypothetically when you're in an interest rate environment where interest rates are going down, but they come with their own fair share of risk. You can mitigate that risk just by getting a low fixed rate mortgage and now you know exactly what your mortgage payments are going to be for the entire length of your mortgage. You have two main categories of mortgages. You have conventional mortgages and then you have government mortgages. Government mortgages is money coming from the government and conventional mortgages are not. That's the main difference. But the way these different types of mortgages play out is a little bit different when it comes to your down payment and how high your interest rate is going to be. So you really want to understand the differences. So starting with the conventional mortgage, you have a couple of different kinds. You have conforming mortgages, and then you have non-conforming mortgages. All the difference is, is how big your mortgage is. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac set what the limit is for a conforming mortgage. And if you get a mortgage that's bigger than that, it's called a non-conforming mortgage. And then you need something called a jumbo loan. So the difference between these two types of mortgages is really just how big your mortgage is. In 2021, the limit for a conforming mortgage is right around $550,000 for your mortgage, unless you're in a really big city like New York, where now your mortgage limit is a little bit higher. But if you get a mortgage that's smaller than that, you will get a conforming mortgage. If you need a mortgage that's bigger than that, then you're going to need a non-conforming jumbo loan. If you qualify for a conventional conforming mortgage, then you can get a home with a down payment as small as 3%. Now, if you put down 3%, you're going to have to pay additional fees like PMI, which is private mortgage insurance, where you're essentially buying insurance for the bank just in case you foreclose. But just understand that you can buy a home with a low down payment. However, it's going to cost you a little bit more in fees. For the non-conforming mortgage, so if you're getting a larger loan, a jumbo loan, then you're not going to typically get a down payment that's as small as 3%. You're going to have to pay a larger down payment because the bank is risking more money on you. So they're going to want you to put more skin in the game. Once you have 20% equity in your home, or if you put down 20% equity when you buy the home, then you can wipe out PMI. So until you have 20% equity in your home, you're going to be paying that additional fee called PMI with a conventional mortgage. And the advantage with a conventional mortgage over government-based mortgages is typically you get a lower interest rate here because you have a higher credit score requirement. So it's a little bit more difficult to qualify for a conventional mortgage than it is for a government mortgage. Now moving on to government mortgages, the first type of mortgage is the FHA mortgage. So FHA is the Federal Housing Association and the whole point of these FHA mortgages is to help people qualify for a home and mortgage who don't have the best credit score and who might not be able to put down a lot of money as a down payment. So to qualify for an FHA mortgage, you need to only have 3.5% as a down payment and you can qualify for an FHA mortgage in some instances with a credit score lower than 620. Now, the downfall with this is FHA mortgages come with higher interest rates and higher fees. So because lenders will kind of look at you more as a risky investment, you're going to have to pay the price. And so one thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to pay an upfront insurance fee when you get an FHA mortgage and then you're going to have to pay an insurance fee on the back end for the life of your mortgage. So it's not PMI like you have to pay here. It's a different type of insurance, but you have to pay this additional fee in addition to your regular mortgage payments just because you're getting an FHA mortgage. The difference between the insurance fee that you have to pay with an FHA mortgage every single month and this PMI that you have to pay here if you don't have 20% in equity in your home is once you have 20% equity in your home with an FHA mortgage, you have to keep paying that fee. 
So this fee doesn't go away once you have 20% equity versus PMI goes away here once you have 20% equity. So the whole idea is these government mortgages can help you get a home and then once you can qualify for a conventional mortgage, you can refinance out here and get one of these. That way you can pay a lower interest rate and pay less in fees. Second is the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture loans. These are more for rural homes. This is for people who are lower income or moderate income. This allows you to buy a home with 0% down payment in certain instances. So you can buy a home with nothing down, but again, you got to pay higher fees. You're going to have to pay another insurance fee with your mortgage here, and that does not go away once you have 20% equity. So once you have 20% equity, it might make sense for you to refinance and get another loan here, depending on what interest rates are. And third are your VA loans. This is for military personnel and people who were in the military. So VA loans let you qualify for mortgages with 0% down, and these can be typically lower interest rate mortgages. However, because because you're getting a lower interest rate and because you're putting 0% down, you have to pay a higher upfront fee here, an insurance fee with the VA mortgage than you see here or here. So to qualify for a VA mortgage, you have to be a part of the military or have been a part of the military, and then you have to pay that additional fee in the beginning. But with the VA loan, unlike FHA and USDA, you don't have the ongoing insurance fee. So these government mortgages can help you qualify for a home, but with an FHA and USDA mortgage, you might have to pay higher fees during the life of your mortgage. So it might make sense for you to then refinance into a conventional mortgage, again, depending on what interest rates are when you're looking at refinancing, because then you can save some money on your interest rate mortgage and you might not have to pay some of these insurance fees. Third, you gotta understand what changes your mortgage rates. There are five big factors that affect your interest rates and we've gone over four of them. So one of them is whether you're getting a fixed rate or an adjustable rate mortgage. Second is what interest rates are. These are set by the Federal Reserve Bank. Third is how much your credit score is. Fourth is how much money you're putting down. And fifth is how long your mortgage is. To understand this, you really gotta look at it from the perspective of the bank. So banks have all this money, and when they loan this money out, it is an investment for the bank. So the riskier the investment is for the bank, the more money they're gonna wanna see as a return. So if you're asking for a risky loan, the bank is gonna wanna charge you more money. And one of the ways to qualify a riskier investment is how long you wanna borrow the money for. The longer the bank has to go without their money, the riskier the investment is. And so when you compare a 15 year mortgage with a 30 year mortgage, a 30 year mortgage is gonna seem a little bit riskier for the bank because their money is gonna be with you for 30 years. And so the bank is gonna charge you a little bit higher in interest. With a 15 year mortgage, the bank is gonna get their money back in 15 years, not 30 years. And so they can charge you a little bit less in interest because it's less risky for the bank. This is where you have to make more of a personal financial decision because when you get a 30 year mortgage, you can buy a bigger home and have a smaller monthly payment because your payments are extended over 30 years instead of just over 15 years. So if you look at the same mortgage over 30 years or 15 years, your 15 year mortgage is gonna have a lower interest rate, but your monthly payments are gonna be higher because you have to pay the mortgage off within 15 years. If you extend it over 30 years, your monthly payment is naturally gonna be smaller so you can qualify for more home. One thing that you can also do to help you with your mortgage rate is just shop around. It's crazy how many people don't do this. They just go to the bank that they normally go to for their mortgage without shopping around. Some lenders are gonna charge you a whole lot less in interest for the exact same mortgage. So it is in your best interest to shop around and make sure you're getting the lowest interest rate on your mortgage. There's really no excuse not to shop around anymore because you can shop around on the internet for your mortgage and it only takes a few minutes. If you wanna learn more about how to do that, our team put together an amazing guide that walks you through how to get the best interest rate on your mortgage or refinance. So if you wanna learn more about how to do that, I will link the article for you in the description below. Fourth, when it comes to getting a mortgage, it is your job to know what you can afford. It is not your real estate agent's job and it is not your bank's job. Your real estate agent's job is in the business of selling you a home. Your banker's job is in the business of selling you a mortgage. It is in both of these parties' best interest to give you the best home, which is typically the biggest home, which is also the home that's gonna give these two parties the biggest commission check. Now, your job is to know what you can afford for your wallet. Just because you can qualify for a million dollar home doesn't mean that you can afford it, and it doesn't mean that you should buy it. It's funny, every time I say this, I get these kind of angry messages from bankers or real estate people because I'm telling you to buy what you can afford, not buy what you can qualify for, and so that's not good news for the real estate agent or the banker, but let me show you what I mean. When it comes to affording a home, there's two things you have to look at. You have to look at the down payment and then the monthly payment. Your real estate agent and your banker's job is to get you into the home. 
So they're going to do whatever they can and pull whatever strings they can to get you into a home, even if you can't necessarily afford it. So when it comes to the down payment, a lot of times they're going to try to push you into a home with zero to 5% down. That way you just, you can get into that home of your dreams. Now, just because you can get into a home with 0% down or 5% down does not mean that you can afford it. If you really want to be able to afford your home, you want to be putting down 20%. Now, I know that's a lot of money. You want to buy a $300,000 home, that's $60,000 in cash you got to put down. But if you really want to be able to afford a home, you need to be putting down 20%. When you put down 20%, now you don't have to pay the higher fees, you don't have to pay the higher interest rates, and you have more equity in your home. When it comes to your mortgage payment, your monthly payment, your bank is going to say that they want your monthly payment to be something like 28% of your gross take home pay. So this is before taxes. So if you take your total take home pay before taxes, 28% of that should be your mortgage. I don't want you to pay that much money towards your mortgage because then on top of that, you got to pay your taxes. You got to pay all of your other bills, your utility bills, your car payments, everything else. I don't want you to do that. So what I want you to do is I want your monthly payment to be 25% of your actual take home pay. So you take the money you're making, you pay your taxes, and now out of what's left, one fourth should be the maximum of how much you're paying towards your mortgage. When you do that, you will leave enough money for your savings and for your investments. That way you can work to build yourself wealth instead of having all of your money going into the bank to make the bank rich. I want you to use your money to make yourself rich by paying a maximum of 25% of your take home pay to your bank and then using as much as you can to invest and save in your own wealth. Now I know this might mean you might have to work a little bit harder to own a home. You might have to buy a little bit smaller home and you might have to save more money for your down payment. But you are going to sleep a whole lot easier knowing you're not stretching yourself too thin to buy this dream home that you can't even afford. Now you're using your money the right way. That way you can make yourself rich instead of just your banker richer. The fifth thing that you have to understand when it comes to getting a mortgage is you might potentially want to refinance out of your mortgage in the future. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier in this video. If you get a government mortgage, you might have to pay a little bit higher interest rates and you might have to pay additional insurance on your mortgage. Now, if interest rates come down and you build more equity in your home, you could use this as an opportunity to refinance into a lower interest rate mortgage and to get rid of some of these fees. That way now you have the home that you're still living in and all you see happen is your monthly payments drop because you have a better mortgage now. The thing that I want to remind you here that in order to refinance your mortgage, you need to see property values stay the same or go up. But real estate prices don't always go up. So you want to keep that in mind because people who are buying homes in the early 2000s, they were buying homes with these low teaser rates thinking that when interest rates go up, they'll just be able to refinance their mortgage and then get these lower interest rates. The problem was that home prices dropped. So when people went to refinance their mortgages, turns out they couldn't qualify for a new refinance because they didn't have any equity in the homes because their home values dropped. So yeah, refinancing can be a great tool if you can refinance into a lower interest rate mortgage, but you don't want to go into a home thinking, yeah, you know what, I'll make the sacrifice now. That way in five years I can refinance into a better mortgage. You don't want to do that because there's no way to predict what the world or what the real estate market or what the housing market is going to look like in five years. You don't want to be in that position that people were in back in 2008 and 2009. If you do want to see how to refinance your mortgage and save the most money, the article I linked in the description below walks you through how to do that. But what I'm trying to say is this is why it's so important for you to be able to afford the home that you're buying right now because you don't want to run in a situation where five, 10 years down the road, home prices drop or you can't refinance because you thought you were going to be able to and now you're stuck in a home that you cannot afford. Make sure you can afford the home today and not kind of rely on the stars to align in the future so you can afford the home. Why in the world would you pay $2,000 a month to rent a home when you can buy the exact same home and only have to pay $1,300 a month for your mortgage? You might have asked yourself a question like this before and in this video I'm going to be breaking down the truth between buying and renting a home. The only people that rent are losers and broke people. If you want to build wealth, you need to buy your home that way you can start building equity. You've probably heard something like that before. But if that's so true, why is the fastest growing demographic of renters rich people. More rich people are going out of their way to rent their homes now than ever before. So either all your friends that keep nagging you to buy a home are all millionaires or rich people know something that we don't. 
Well, I'm going to be going over those secrets. In this video, I'm going to be going over the real cost of owning a home versus renting a home. And then I'm going to be going over what you need to know before you can actually afford a home. But before we get into that, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash that thumbs up button below because the way the YouTube algorithm works, if you do not smash that thumbs up button, then YouTube is much less likely to show you and other people our financial news and education videos. Let's assume that you want to buy this beautiful $400,000 house. So I'm going to draw you right here. Got to give you a nice mustache. So you want to buy this $400,000 house and let's assume the interest rates are 3% a year and you get a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. If you do that, this house is going to cost you $1,300 a month for your mortgage. If across the street, this exact same home was listed for rent, it would be renting for $2,500 a month. It's going to cost you $1,300 a month to buy this house and $2,500 a month to rent this house. If you look at just these numbers alone, you would say, obviously, it is cheaper to buy this home but it's really not so simple because you forgot to look at five different factors. You forgot to look at property taxes, maintenance, the cost of capital, your personal income taxes, and what I call your 10 year plan. Let's start with number one, property taxes. When you rent your home, you're not paying property taxes. It's included in your rent. When you buy your home, property taxes are separate. A simple rule of thumb is you can assume that property taxes will be 1% of your total home's value. So $4,000 a year, which adds up to $333 a month for property taxes. Just so you know, this 1% rule for property taxes is just a rule of thumb. It could be more or less depending on where you live, but it gives us a good idea for this example. Second, let's take a look at maintenance because when you rent your home and you break your toilet because you ate, you can fill in the blank, your landlord is the one that has to come and pay the bill to fix your toilet. When your roof gets old, your landlord has to fix it. When your furnace gets old, your landlord is the one who has to pay the bill. When you own your home, you're responsible for all the repairs, upgrades, and maintenance. Like every 20, 25 years, you might have to put on a new roof that might cost you $25,000. Every 20 years, you might have to put in a $5,000 furnace. Every 15 years, you might have to put in a $4,000 AC, plus kitchen remodels, plus bathroom repairs, plus windows. Add that all up and you can add in another $350 a month for maintenance maintenance and repairs, assuming you're not doing major upgrades to the property. Now, this doesn't mean that every single month you're going to have $350 going out to do maintenance on the property, but over the long run, owning the home, you can kind of estimate about $350 a month for a house this size. Third, you have to look at the opportunity cost or the cost of capital, because when you bought this home, you had to put 20% down, which is $80,000 on a $400,000 home. If you don't have $80,000 to buy this home, then you're going to be paying PMI. I'll get to affordability for homes a little bit later in this video, but you put $80,000 down to buy this home and the $80,000 is money that you could have put into the stock market. It's money you could have invested into a business. It's money you could have used to buy an investment property, but you used it to buy your dream home. So there's an opportunity cost that you have to weigh. Think of it this way. Let's assume you have $1,000 in your pocket and there are only two things that you can do with this $1,000. You can go to the store and buy a really nice scarf or you can invest this $1,000 and in two years, this $1,000 will be worth $2,000. So if you go and buy the scarf, not only are you losing the $1,000 that you have to spend for the scarf, but you're also losing the opportunity to make that extra $1,000. So you're actually losing out on $2,000 because it's the cost of the scarf, the $1,000, and it's the $1,000 opportunity that you lost. It's the same with your home. You had $80,000 in your bank account, and now that you use it to buy this home, you can't use that $80,000 to invest in the stock market. And let's assume that you can get a 5% return on your money in the stock market. Now, the average return in the stock market is between 7 and 10% a year, but I'm being conservative. If you can get a 5% return a year on your stock market, that means you're losing out on the opportunity to make something like $4,000 a year. So the opportunity cost of you taking this $80,000 and putting it into this home, as opposed to taking this $80,000 and putting it into the stock market where you would make $4,000 a year, which is another $333 a month, is the opportunity cost you are losing of $333 a month because if you put this money into the stock market inside of your home, you'd be making an additional $333 a month. At this point, many of you are probably thinking, 
But just breathe, that's not a fair analysis. The value of your home is going to go up too because your home is an investment and real estate never goes down in value. Now, I get it. I'm a real estate investor. I have purchased properties that have doubled or tripled in value in a very short amount of time. So if your property goes up by 4% a year, then this $333 a month that you're losing in opportunity cost is recovered through appreciation in your home. But it's really hard to calculate that because you're not buying this home for the sole purpose of making money. You are buying this home as a place to live, not as an investment. You're buying this home to live in and use. You're not buying it to flip. Can you make money on your home? Yeah, absolutely. But remember, you're not buying this home to get rich. You're buying this home to use it. If you were buying this property just to make money, then it would be better for you to go out and buy an investment property. That way you can get passive income and the appreciation instead of buying a home to live in. You could very well see that 4% appreciation in the home value of your home but you don't actually realize or get that money until you sell your home and sell the place where you live. Most people are not buying their home thinking, okay, I'm gonna move into this home and as soon as my property value goes up by 20%, I'm gonna sell this home and move somewhere else. If you do, then you can just ignore everything I'm saying, but most people don't. Most people are buying their home thinking, I wanna live here, that way I can raise my family and settle down and make memories. That way they can live in this home and enjoy it for as long as possible. And then they're gonna sell when they absolutely need to sell or if something comes up. So when it comes time for you to sell, you're at the mercy of the real estate market. You're not selling because you think, oh, property values have gone up. Let me sell my home and move somewhere else. If home values are up when it comes time for you to sell, then you're golden. If home values are not up, then that appreciation is not there. Remember, if the 2008 recession taught us anything, it's that real estate doesn't always go up in value. Fourth is your personal income taxes, because when you own your home, you actually get a deduction on the interest you pay on your mortgage. So unlike these three, this interest deduction actually makes the cost of home ownership a little bit cheaper, because every single month when you're paying this $1,300, some of this money is going into your bank's pocket as profit through interest, while the other money is principal, which goes towards your loan value. Banks are smart and they wanna get paid before you do. And what they do is they front load your loans. So out of this $1,300 that you're paying during the first few years of your loan, almost all of this $1,300 is going into your bank's pocket as interest and very little of this money is going towards your loan principal. Towards the end of your mortgage is flipped because now almost all of your money is going towards the principal value of your home because you paid the bank during the first years of your loan. So during the end of the mortgage is when you're actually getting the real benefit and building equity in your home and the beginning parts of your mortgage is when your bank is making all the money. What that means is a portion of this $1,300 that you're paying every single month is going to be deducted from your personal income taxes. Now, the amount of benefit that you have from this income tax deduction is gonna depend on your tax bracket. The higher your tax bracket, the more valuable your deduction is. In other words, the more money you make, the more valuable this deduction is, and you're gonna get a bigger deduction in the first half of your loan than you're gonna see in the second half of your loan. So to keep things simple, let's assume that this interest deduction lets you keep an additional $200 a month in your pocket. So based off of these numbers, if we add this up, it looks like the total cost for you to own your home is actually closer to $2,116 a month. So based off of these numbers and compared to this rent payment, which can vary based on your area, it looks like based off of these numbers, it is cheaper to own this home based off of these numbers compared to this rent, but we're still not done yet. Before we get into whether you can actually afford to buy a home, let's talk about number five your tenure plan, because as somebody who is a real estate investor and as somebody who used to work actively as a real estate salesperson, I can tell you that buying and selling your own home is a big deal. This isn't something that you're just gonna do in your free time when you feel like it. When we're talking about buying or selling your dream home for your family, it is always on your mind. You're always looking at home prices. You're always thinking about mortgages. You're always thinking about how you're gonna move your property. Owning your home takes work. It's time intensive and it locks you down. It's not something you can just leave with a snap of a finger. If you plan on living in this home for 10 years, then it's no big deal. But if you're not sure if you're committed to the area where you're buying, or if you're not sure if you're even gonna be there in six months or a year, is it really worth all that headache to buy a home when you might be moving out in just a few months and you have to sell this property again? When you rent a property, you're not tied down. You can just break your lease and move if you really needed to. When you're leasing, you have the flexibility to live in new communities and try different homes and see what you really like and where you wanna live. It's hard to put a dollar figure on this 10-year plan, but it is definitely something you wanna consider because there's a lot of time involved and there's a lot of brain power involved when it comes to moving out of a home that you own as opposed to a home that you rent. So based off of these numbers, 
and these mortgage rates and this down payment, it is cheaper for you to buy this home than it would be for you to rent this home. But if the going rental rate for the same property was $2,000 a month as opposed to $2,500 a month, then it would be cheaper for you to rent this home than buy the home, which is why you need to do the numbers. But you also want to take a look at whether you can afford to buy this home. So when it comes to actually buying your home and saving the most money when you buy your home, we have tons of articles on this on our website, theminoritymindset.com. I'll also link an article for you up here and in the description below. But when it comes to actually affording your home, there's five things you need to take a look at. You want to look at how much savings you have. You want to look at how much money you have for the down payment. You want to look at your debt to income ratio. You want to look at your credit score and you want to look at how much money you have put aside for your investments. Let's start with number one, your savings. If you don't have any savings, like the majority of Americans, you cannot afford to own your home. And when I say you can't afford to own your home, I don't mean that you're not going to get approved for a mortgage. I mean you can't actually afford it for your own personal wealth. If you go out and you buy your own home without any savings, you are putting your future financial freedom at risk. I own a lot of real estate and I can tell you that with real estate comes repairs. Anytime I buy a property, I do multiple inspections. First, I inspect the property. Then I hire a private property inspector. Then the city inspector inspects the property. Then my contractor inspects the property. And then my property manager inspects the property. I go through five different inspections anytime I buy a property. Still, things break and they go wrong. It is not cheap to fix an electrical issue. It's not cheap to fix a plumbing issue. And it's not cheap to fix a foundational issue. The reason why I'm emphasizing this so much is because 65% of Americans are homeowners. So if this chart represents America, 65% would be 25%. 50, 75, so 65 would be something right around here. So this is 65% of America, and these are the homeowners, which means 35% of America are renters. Well, at the very same time, 70% of Americans do not, do not have $1,000 saved up for an emergency. So let's look at this from the best case scenario. Let's assume that all of these renters, this 35% of America, do not have $1,000 saved up for an emergency. That means there's still another 35% of America that does not have $1,000 saved up for an emergency. So remember, this is 65%. So now, if another 35% of this 65 does not have $1,000 saved up for an emergency, that is more than half of the homeowners in America. So only 30% of Americans have $1,000 or more saved up for an emergency. And that means that the very best case scenario is that one out of two homeowners have $1,000 or more saved up for an emergency. Half of American homeowners do not have $1,000 sitting in the bank account to protect them from a broken pipe. Remember this chart next time your cousin Bunty tells you, yo man, you have to own a home because the mortgage payments are so much cheaper than rent. Yeah, your mortgage payment is less than your rent, but your credit card bill to fix your plumbing isn't. Let's talk about your down payment for a second. Do you want to know who wants you to own a home besides your cousin Bunty? The government and your bank. And what they do is they make it more accessible for Americans to own a home by reducing how much of a down payment you need. Doesn't that sound nice? Home ownership is more accessible for Americans. So what do they do? They lower your down payment requirement. That way you can buy a home with little to no down payment. There's only one problem with that. People who can't afford to own a home shouldn't own a home. Why? Because they can't afford to own a home. Now, just because you can't afford to own a home today does not mean that you can't ever own a home. It means you can't afford to own it today. I want you to be able to own your home and be able to afford it. Because if you can't afford to own your home, then what happens is your home ends up owning you. Do you want to know what happens when you have a ton of people owning a home who can't afford to own a home? You get a repeat of 2008 because real estate prices don't always go up. And so now if the economy slows down and you have a ton of people who can't afford their homes, then these people are going to have to walk away from their homes because they don't have the means to protect themselves from an emergency. And so then you have a real estate crash. If you want to afford the home that you're buying, you need to have a minimum 20% down payment. So if you're buying a $400,000 home, you need to have $80,000 in cash to put down to buy the home. And it's not just me saying this. Your bank is saying this too, just indirectly. Because if you don't have 20% to put down on your home, your bank charges you an extra fee called PMI. PMI is mortgage insurance, but it's not mortgage insurance for you. 
it's mortgage insurance for your bank that you have to pay. See, your bank is kind of worried that they're going to have to foreclose on you because they know you didn't have the money for a solid down payment. And so if the bank forecloses on you, they're going to lose a lot of money. So what do they do? They make you buy the bank's insurance through PMI if you don't have enough money for a solid down payment. Debt to income. If you have a lot of credit card debt and student loans and a car payment, you should not go out and buy a home because the solution to your debt problem is not going out and taking on more debt. But Jaspreet, my cousin Bunty told me that buying a home makes me wealthy because I'll be building equity. The solution to debt is not more debt. Right now, you need to rent a small place and use all of your extra cash to pay down this excess debt that you have. If you have credit card debt, your credit card company is skinning you alive. And right now, your sole focus should be to pay down your high interest debt. That way you can afford to buy a home. Just because you can't afford to buy it today does not mean that you cannot afford to buy it ever. You need to get your money right. That way you can buy a home and actually afford it. That way you can enjoy your home. Fourth, if you have cash in the bank, you have money for a down payment and you have very little debt, but you have a bad credit score, then your bank is going to charge you twice as much as they're going to charge somebody with a perfect credit score to buy the exact same home. I get it. You want to buy a home and you want to buy it right now, but this credit score is going to make it way more expensive than it needs to be. So fix that first. That way you can get a good rate on your mortgage. And fifth is your investment cash. Lots of people fall into this trap of thinking that my home is the biggest investment. And so what they do is they go out of their way to buy the biggest home possible. And then anytime you have extra cash, you use it to renovate your home and you buy new things for your home because you keep telling yourself that your home is an investment and your goal is to one day be able to live off of the equity in your home. Owning your home is great. And it's really nice not to have a mortgage, but you do not want to fall into the trap where all of your money is going into your home because you think that is going to be the reason why you get to retire and be financially free. Buy investments, build income streams. It will give you a better return and it will let you sleep a whole lot easier. Plus, when you have investments outside of your home that you live in, then you can make money without having to sell the roof over your head. If you're struggling with your debt and you're trying to figure out what you should do right now to put a hole in your debt this year, you're in the right place because we're going to be going over five strategies that you can use right now to pay down your debt quickly. Debt is a tool. It can make you very wealthy or it can keep you poor depending on how you use the debt. If you're using debt to buy cars and clothes and shoes and purses, well now this debt that you're using is keeping you poor, but it's making your banker rich. But if you're using debt to buy rental properties, hard assets that pay you with cash flow, now this debt can make you rich. The number one reason why the majority of people will never have a chance to ever become wealthy is because they're using all of their money to go out and buy things, liabilities, which keep them poor. And then when they want more liabilities, they're going out and they're financing these liabilities through the help of debt. So now you're going to the bank to help them pay for your car. You're going to the bank with your credit card to help them pay for your wardrobe. You're going to the bank to help them buy you some new name brand clothes. See, when you use debt, you're using tomorrow's income to pay for today's expenses. Because when you go out and you borrow a thousand dollars from the bank, whether it's from a loan or a credit card or a home equity line of credit, you're borrowing a thousand dollars and you're using this money today. Then you're going to have to pay this thousand dollars back from tomorrow's income plus interest. Now, if you borrowed this thousand dollars from the bank and this thousand dollars that you borrowed can make you two thousand dollars, then it's no big deal because now you can take this two thousand dollars, pay back the bank, pay them the interest and put some money in your pocket. So this debt doesn't bother you. But if you take this thousand dollars from the bank and now you go out and buy liabilities, which are losing you money. Well, now this is how you become poorer each and every day because now you have to go to work tomorrow to pay off yesterday's expenses. And then you got to go to work the day after that to pay off yesterday's interest. Now, while this type of consumer debt can destroy so many people's finances and it can destroy so many people's opportunity to ever become wealthy, there is a way out if you have the right financial education. And if you know how to get rid of this consumer debt the right way, that way now you can use your money the right way to make yourself wealthy instead of just making the bank rich. And it doesn't matter what kind of debt you have, student loans, credit cards, mortgages, car loans, the things that I'm going to go over apply to all kinds of debt. And these are things that you can start doing today. That way you can start paying off this debt a lot faster than you would otherwise. So let's jump into these five things. But before I do that, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash that thumbs up button below. And if you haven't already, be sure to join our brand new free discord server called the Guac Talk community. Because as we all know, extra guac is truly a symbol of extra wealth. 
And in this community, you can chat with other minority mindset thinkers about how to invest in real estate, the stock market, the cryptocurrency market, and all things building wealth. This community is completely free, so if you want to chat with and network with other minority mindset thinkers, I'll put the link to how you can join our free Discord server in the description below. The first thing you gotta do before you do anything else is you have to organize your debt. You gotta know how much debt you have, you gotta know the different types of debt that you have, and you need to know how much interest these debts are costing you. If you do not know this, you will not be able to come up with a proper strategy to pay off your debt quickly. This part can be a little bit painful depending on how much debt you have because you're gonna have to look at exactly how much debt you have and you're gonna see how much this is costing you every single day, but you have to do this in order to get started. You need to list out every different type of debt that you have, how much this debt is costing you, meaning what's the interest rate, and how much of this debt that you actually carry. Once you do that, I need you to be honest with yourself, and I need you to ask yourself, how disciplined are you financially? Are you still that person that got you into this debt in the first place, or have you changed? Maybe you got into this debt five years ago, and you turned your finances around, and you no longer spend the way that you did. Are you disciplined now? Yes or no? Once you answer that question for yourself, then you can pick a strategy. The debt snowball strategy or the debt avalanche strategy. The debt snowball strategy is the strategy that Dave Ramsey talks about all the time. What this says is you are gonna list your debts not by the interest rate that you're paying, but by the size of the debt. And what you're gonna do here is you're gonna pay off the smallest debt first and then go to the next smallest and then the next smallest. The whole idea behind this is you're gonna ignore the interest rates and you're gonna pay off debts in a way where you can pay off the smallest balance first, that way you can get the small wins, that way you can get the psychological reassurance that you're doing something right and that you're winning. Here, with the debt avalanche model, what you're gonna do, this is assuming that you're more disciplined, that you have the ability to control your spending and you have the ability to stick to a financial plan. Here, you're gonna organize your debts based off of the interest rates and then you're gonna pay off the highest interest rate debt first because that's the debt that's costing you the most money. Because if one debt is costing you 20% a year and another debt is costing you 7% a year, you're paying way more in interest on the 20% debt, so you wanna pay that one off first. This debt avalanche model goes with that method. The reason why this is for people who are more financially disciplined is because you're not gonna get those same psychological wins as fast as here, because here, you're paying off the smallest balance first. So you'll pay off one debt faster here than here, but in this model, you'll be able to keep more money in your pocket because now you're attacking the debts that are costing you the most money. The reason I need you to be financially disciplined if you do this one, even though it's gonna save you more money, is because if you don't have that financial discipline and now you're trying to pay off your first debt balance, which is a big debt balance, which has a high interest rate, and you keep paying it off, paying it off, paying it off, but you're not seeing that big difference, that big kind of win where the debt goes away yet, well then you might get demotivated. And if you do that, and now you stop paying off your debt, now you're in a worse position, than if you would've just stuck to this model. So this is where you gotta be honest with yourself. If you're financially disciplined, if you can stick to a financial system, then go with this. It'll keep more money in your pocket. If you are not, then stick with this because this will help you pay off your debt. So this is what the process would look like, assuming that you only have three debts. You have student loans, you have credit card debt, and then you have your mortgage. Let's assume that your student loans are costing you 6% a year, your credit cards are costing you 16% a year, and your mortgage is costing you 4.5% a year, and you have $15,000 in student loans, $22,000 of credit card debt, and $300,000 on your mortgage. Now, if you're following the snowball method, now what you wanna do, again, is go by the smallest balance first. In this case, you're gonna go with student loans, then the credit card, and then the housing debt. Now remember, your credit card debt is costing you way more, 16% a year. But with this debt snowball method, you're trying to go for the big wins first. You wanna attack the smallest balance first, which is why you're gonna go after the student loans because you'll be able to pay this off quicker than the larger balance, so that way you get those psychological wins and you can get rid of some of the debts. If you have that financial discipline and you can stick to that financial system, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna pay off the most expensive debt first, the credit card debt. It'll take you a little bit longer here because you have more debt, but now you're getting rid of the highest interest rate first. That way now you can stop bleeding cash and then you can go to the next one that's costing you the most money. Here are the student loans that they need to attack the housing payment. So here, you're gonna go by the interest rates. Here, you're gonna go by the balance. I don't care which one you do as long as you stick with the strategy and I just need you to be honest with yourself because the worst thing that you can do is say, oh yeah, I like the idea of trying to save some money here and paying off the higher interest rates first, but then you can't stick with it because then you get demoralized or you get demotivated. If that's you, be honest and just stay here. It's okay as long as you just stick with the strategy. The second thing that I want you to do is I want you to 
stop sending in monthly debt payments. I'll show you why. So let's assume that you have $30,000 of credit card debt, and this is costing you, let's say, 15% annually. And so right now, your monthly payments for the purposes of this video are $500 a month. So what most people do when they have this type of situation is they're gonna send in a check for $500 a month, or it's gonna be a direct deposit, whatever it is, an automatic payment, where you're paying $500 a month to your credit card company. I want you to stop doing that. If you follow that model, so let's say option one, and in this model you're paying $500 a month, it's gonna take you 112 months to pay this off, and you're gonna end up paying this $30,000 plus $25,800 in interest. Instead, what I want you to do is option two. In this case, instead of sending $500 a month, I want you to send in $250 every two weeks. So now you're gonna send in bi-weekly payments and this is essentially gonna end up being the same. You're sending in $250 every two weeks or $500 over the course of every four weeks, but now you're not gonna pay off your debt in 112 months, you're gonna pay off your debt in just 95 months and now you're gonna pay the same $30,000 of your principal balance, which is what you owe, but in the interest side of things, instead of paying $25,800, you're only gonna pay $21,200. So you're gonna save over $4,500 in interest, and you're gonna save another year of paying off this credit card bill just because now you're paying every two weeks instead of every month. This is one of the simplest hacks to pay off your debt quicker, and the reason why this works is because in this situation, option one, you're gonna send in 12 months worth of this payment every single year because you're sending in $500 a month and you're gonna do that 12 times. In this situation, there are 52 weeks a year, which means you're gonna send in 26 payments of $250, which ends up being 13 payments of $500 a year, because in this situation, you're sending in $250 26 times, which is the same as sending in $500 13 times, but you don't even see it happen, because in this situation, you're doing it gradually over the course of a year. So you won't even notice the difference in your finances, in your bank account, but it's gonna really show up in your bank account when you see how much faster you can pay this down versus this down. Now you know in what order to pay off your debts, and now you know how to pay off your debts even quicker, the third thing you gotta do is you wanna attack your debts even harder. And the quickest and the simplest way to attack your debts even harder is to cut down some of your expenses so you have some extra cash. And now when you have this extra cash, throw it at your debt payments. That way now you have more money going directly to the principal value of your debt. Because when you pay this extra money to your debt payments, you don't gotta pay any interest on that. So anytime you send in an extra $100, the $100 is going directly to your principal balance and you don't have to pay any interest interest on that. So this allows you to pay off your debt way faster, but you gotta learn how to find this cash. This is where right now you wanna cut back on some of your expenses, that way you have some extra cash in your pocket because one of the easiest ways to keep more cash in your pocket is just by not spending it. So if you don't gotta go on vacation, or if you don't gotta go buy those brand name clothes, or if you don't gotta go out to eat, this is an easy way to put a little bit more cash in your pocket that you can throw directly towards your debt because now you have some extra cash and instead of just spending this money, you're gonna take this extra cash in your pocket and you're gonna use it to pay down your debt. That way now, you don't have to worry about this debt anymore. This is something that takes a lot of sacrifice. And this is something you have to be able to do. That way you have the financial discipline to actually build wealth. Because it's not just a matter of sacrificing some of the nice things that you want. It's knowing what's important to you and doing whatever it takes to make that happen. Plus, everybody has at least a few thousand dollars worth of stuff in their home that they don't use. Old clothes, old furniture, old TVs, old phones, old computers, old electronics. Everybody has a bunch of stuff sitting around in their home that's just sitting there collecting dust. If you have the stuff that you don't need, sell it, and when you got that extra cash, use it to pay down this debt. This is an easy and simple way, that way now you have some more cash that we can throw just at your debt, but I don't want you to live broke for the rest of your life. The whole idea behind being financially educated and becoming wealthy is not so you can keep pinching pennies and keep couponing, it's so you can live the life you want, buy the things you want, enjoy the luxury you want without worrying about the price. But in order to get there, you have to know the financial discipline that it actually takes. And that's why now, once you know how to control your spending, now it's all about growing the pie and earning more money. Because the fastest way to pay down your debt is to first have a strategy. We talked about that. You pick the debt avalanche, you pick the debt snowball. 
then you gotta know some of the basic hacks, like just by doing the bi-weekly payments instead of doing the monthly payments. Now, it's all about finding some extra cash and throwing it at your debt, because like I said just a second ago, every extra dollar that you put towards your debt payments is going directly towards your principal balance and you don't have to pay any interest on that. So the more extra cash you have, the more you'll be able to pay down your debt faster. So the fastest way to pay down your debt is not just by following some of these hacks, it's by getting more cash. And the simplest and quickest way to get some more cash is to cut back on some of your expenses. But at the end of the day, there's a limit to how much you could cut your expenses. There's a limit to how much you can squeeze pennies out of yourself, but there's no limit to how much money you can earn. So what I want you to do is first, you gotta have the financial discipline of knowing how to live below your means because that's the discipline you need to understand how to manage your money. If you don't have that discipline, it doesn't matter if you're making $100,000 a year or $10 million a year. If you don't know how to manage the money you have, you will never be able to build wealth. But once you know how to do that, now I want you to think a little bit bigger. How can you expand the pie? How can you grow the amount of money that you're making because there's no limit to how much money that you can earn. And if you can earn more money, now what you wanna do is you wanna take this extra cash and throw it towards your debt. And the faster you can earn this extra cash, the faster you can pay down this debt. Some of the obvious ways to earn some more money are by putting a little bit more effort into your job. Maybe you're working overtime. Maybe you get a promotion. Maybe you get a raise. Maybe you get a bonus. Maybe you're gonna work a second side job. Or maybe you can try to get another job in sales where you have more upside potential where now you're earning on commission. These are all ways that you can earn more money at your job. But I want you to also understand what the full range of possibilities are. We are living in the digital age, the internet age. And what I need you to do is I want you to spend some time learning how you can make money on the internet. Because the way the internet works is people around the world are spending time on their phones and their computers. And more and more people around the world are doing this now than ever before. And this is a trend that is not slowing down and it's not going to slow down anytime in the near future. So what I need you to do, instead of just working harder to job, which is great, that's an accessible way for you to start earning some more money right now. But if you want to really be able to scale the amount of money that you're making, which you can use, to now pay down your debt and you can use to help build your wealth by investing into assets, you need to know how to make money on the internet. The way it works is you have to understand how to create content, how to drive eyeballs to whatever it is you have, whatever brand you have, you need to create content, get eyeballs onto you, and you need to learn how to turn these eyeballs into dollars. Look, the easiest and fastest way to pay down your debt is to first have the strategy, you have the financial discipline, you have the financial education, and once you have those things, you have the system, you just need more money to throw into the system, that way now the system has cash to actually pay itself off. And so now if you wanna do that faster, you need some more cash. Yes, you can work harder at your job, but if you really want to get there faster, you need to know how to create new streams of income and the internet has made it more accessible than ever. That doesn't mean it's easy. It's actually very hard because not everybody has access to the internet. But what I want you to do is understand how you can turn the internet into a machine that's printing you money. But you have to learn how to make money on the internet. How do you produce content that people want to see? Now, how do you turn this content into something that's going to produce you dollars? If you can figure that system out, you will have a new stream of income that you can use to pay down your debt and start buying you assets. Plus, once you start seeing more of the financial success and you have more of a financial breathing cushion, you're going to be more interested in learning more about how do you actually buy assets? How do you create passive income? How do you create new income streams from the money that you have? How do you invest your money to build wealth? This is what financial education is all about. First, creating the financial financial breathing room and then it's all about buying assets that way assets can pay you with more money because at the end of the day nobody can work 24 hours a day seven days a week but your money can this is why you need to have the financial breathing room because if you're working all day and night just to pay off your debt you will never have the opportunity to build wealth the way you build wealth is by owning the assets and so if you do want to learn more about how you can start generating passive income by investing your money our team has put together a free guide on how you can start generating passive income today and some different strategies that you can use to start investing your money for passive income this guide is completely free when you sign up for a daily newsletter so if you want to learn more and see how you can start generating passive income by investing your money i'll put the link to how you can download this guide in the description below. And the fifth and final step to really paying down this debt as fast as possible is to not make the same mistakes that got you into this financial mess in the first place. Because if you're spending all your time now working to come up with the right debt payment strategy, and now you're cutting your costs so you have some extra cash, you're working hard to earn some extra cash, that way now you're just throwing money at your debt, and then you go out and you see this brand new TV on sale. And you're like, ooh, this $2,000 TV would look really nice in my room. 
except I don't have $2,000. And then the salesperson tells you that this sale is gonna expire on Friday. And on Friday, the price is gonna go up from $2,000 to $3,800. And then you don't wanna have to pay $3,800, so what do you do? You pull out your credit card, you open a new line of credit to buy this new TV, and now you're starting right back where you were. This goes back to having the right financial discipline because if you do not have the financial discipline to understand how to control your spending, you will never have the opportunity to build wealth. If you wanna be able to pay down your debt and be able to build your wealth, you need to have the financial discipline of knowing what you can buy. And this is where you gotta know what you can afford because we live in a spending culture and a debt culture where when you want something, you gotta have it now. And I want you to have the nice things. I want you to have the luxury things. I want you to have the exotic, expensive things I just want you to be able to afford it first. That means no more financing something that does not put money in your pocket. If it's not paying you, you can't finance it. And second, if you wanna be able to buy something, I want you to be able to afford it. And so when we're talking about being able to afford something, the easiest way to understand that is just to follow a rule of five. If you can't buy five of them, you can't afford one of them. So when you see that $2,000 TV and you don't have $10,000 in the bank, well, you can't afford that $2,000 TV. Now you might be thinking, but just put it, that's really hard. And you're right. Becoming wealthy is not easy. If it was, everybody would be wealthy. But this is where you gotta decide. Are you willing to pay that price today? That way you can pay any price in the future. If so, you gotta be willing to put in that work. That way you can have that extra cash. That way you can invest. That way you can build that wealth. Because once you have the wealth, hey, you can buy whatever you want. Because now you're wealthy. If you wanna get your finances in order, the first thing you need to do is not hire an expensive money coach or financial planner or financial advisor. The first thing you need to do is just track your money. Once you're tracking money, you wanna make some adjustments to how you're spending your money. Once you make those adjustments, make sure you're implementing those adjustments and then rinse and repeat. As you start to get your money in order, that's when you can start doing the fancy stuff, maybe getting a financial advisor, maybe getting a money coach, maybe reading a whole bunch of financial books, maybe then start going out and figuring out how you wanna invest your money. But the very first thing you gotta do is you gotta start tracking your money. And that means I want you just to go out and get a piece of paper, get a Google sheet, use an Excel sheet, does not matter. And at the very top, you gotta write your income. Now, if you have multiple sources of income or if you have multiple incomes in your household, Write them down here. Where is your money coming in from? Is it your job, your W-2? Is it your side hustles? Is it your business? Is it your investment income? Wherever the income is, write it down right here. That way you know exactly how much money you made over the last month. You wanna do this month by month, that's probably the easiest way to do this. Then, once you got a total number for your income, the next thing you wanna do is you're gonna write down your expenses. Now, same concept. You're gonna take out your bank statements, you're gonna take out your debit card statements. You're gonna take out your credit card statements. I want you to take a look at all of your expenses. And the reason why it's easier for you to use a Google Sheet or Excel Sheet is because it's gonna be easier for you to categorize these a little bit later on. But if you like paper, that's fine. Now, take out all of these and you need to know exactly where every penny went. How much money did you spend on restaurants? How much money you spend on groceries? How much money you spend on vacations? How much money you spend on your rent or your mortgage? How much money did you spend on your utilities? How much money did you spend on Netflix and everything in between? Write each one of these down. Then ideally you will categorize these and then you're gonna write down your total expenses. Then below that, you're gonna write your other numbers here. How much money did you save? How much money did you invest? And how much money did you give to charity? Once you have this right here, now you have a financial spreadsheet showing you what's going on with your money. Because most people, and I'm just saying this generally, I'm saying this statistically, most Americans, the vast majority of Americans, have absolutely no idea of how much money they're making, how much money they're spending, where they're spending their money, how much are they saving, and how much are they investing, and how much are they giving to charity. Start with this. Once you do this, I can immediately guarantee that as soon as you see this, you're gonna to wanna to make some adjustments. I don't even have to tell you what to do. And the reason why is because when you do this, you're grading yourself and you're gonna see, holy crap, how much money did I just spend at restaurants last month? How much money did I spend going out on my car last month? How much money did I spend on groceries last month? And immediately, you're gonna start making some changes. Because when you see how much money you spend at groceries, maybe you're gonna start creating a grocery list. And you're gonna say, unless it's on my grocery list, I don't buy this thing at the grocery store. If you see that you spent $600 at Benihana's last month, you're gonna say, okay, I'm not eating out this month. I'm gonna go and cook my own meals this month. So 
I don't want to give you a blanket statement of how you start spending your money yet because I want you to number one, track your money. Then number two, I want you to make adjustments on how you want to start spending your money. And these adjustments that you make are going to depend on what your financial statements look like. Then number three is I want you to actually implement these things. That means now you have the statement for last month. What do you think you're going to do next month? Yes, you're going to do this again. That means month after month, and it shouldn't take you that long after you do it the first time. The first time, it's going to take you the longest. The second time, it's going to take you a little bit less time. But by the third time, you're going to be able to do it in 15 to 30 minutes. Every month, you want to make a little sheet of how much money you're making and what's going on with your money. That way, you can understand what's going on with your money because it's going to help you make better decisions with your money. Then, it's number four, rinse and repeat. Because now what's going to happen is once you take a look at this two months down the line, you're going to have a much better financial grasp of your money. You're going to see how much money you're making. You're going to know what your expenses are like. You're going to have a better control of your expenses. And now you're going to be looking at how can I optimize my expenses? How many of these bills can I renegotiate? How many of these bills can I get rid of because I'm not using them before? Can we downsize the car? Do we really need a car that's expensive that takes premium gas that has $782 a month just in the monthly payment without including all the other fees? Can you downgrade on these items? And these are the questions you're going to start answering when you get to month two and month three. And I don't have to tell you what to do. You have to start with this if you want to get your finances in order, because most people's financial statements look like this. You make money, you spend money, and then you wonder where all of your money went. And then everybody says, Oh, okay, well, I'm making some money. I got to get my money in order. I have no real wealth. I have no real investments. I want to get my life in order. I want to have some cash in the bank. Maybe you should start investing my money. And so now you have this financial statement going on right here. And then the next thing that people do is they go open a stock brokerage account. Now I'm going to start throwing some money to the stock brokerage. You put aside $1,000 and now you put $1,000 into the stock brokerage account. And you can say, I'm now going to become wealthy with this $1,000 investment. What stock should I buy? And now you go out and buy a stock that you read online that you think is a good investment. And then when the stock goes down in value to $780, you wonder what the heck is going on in the world. You thought that investing was supposed to make you richer, but now you just lost 200 some dollars by putting your money into what you thought was a good investment. This is how most people become and stay broke. It's not because you're not investing your money to the right places is because you have no system of what to do with your money. Once you got this in order, the next thing you want to do is create a few different bank accounts. I like to say that you need to have at least three different bank accounts, a bank account for your spending money, a bank account for your savings money, and a bank account for your investments money. And the reason why you want to keep these in separate bank accounts is because if you keep all of your money in one bank account, how do you know which money is supposed to be invested? which money is supposed to be saved for an emergency, and which money is supposed to be spent. And you might say, oh, I'm good with the money. I know that this $3,000 that's in there is just for my savings, and this $8,000 there is for my investments, and the other money I can spend. Well, when it's all in one bank account, it's very easy to accidentally spend your savings money, and it's very easy to accidentally finance your investment money. And this is why you want to go out and create three different bank accounts. And what you can do now, thanks to technology, is many banks will allow you for free to create an automatic withdrawal and deposit. That way now when you get paid in one bank account, you can automatically have some of this money move to your second bank account. So you have three different bank accounts. This is where all your money gets deposited when you get paid. Then anytime you get paid, you can create an automatic withdrawal and deposit. That way a percentage of this money goes into your investment money and a percentage of this investment goes into your savings account. Now you're separating your money that way you cannot accidentally spend your investing money and you can't accidentally spend your savings money. Now this is where everybody asks, well, how do I invest my money and where do I invest my money? I'm not going to go too deep into investing in this video, but we have a full ebook on how do you invest your money at Briefs Media titled How to Build Wealth as an Investor. And this starts from the basics of how do you build the mindset of an investor to how do you save your first couple thousand dollars, but then it gets a little bit more advanced going over different investing ideas. How do you invest for cash flow? What are different investing strategies? How do you spend your money smartly? To then how do you earn more money? To then how do you protect your assets? There's a ton of value in this ebook. You can read this ebook completely for free. All you got to do is click the link down in the description below or go to briefs.co slash ebook. The biggest shift here when it comes to getting a hold of your finances, turning your money around and becoming wealthy isn't just creating some financial system and building some financial education. It's also about the mindset of money. Because a lot of times we grew up with no financial education and no idea of how we're supposed to use and spend our money. And so most people assume now when you start making money is you got to go out and spend your money. This is America's consumerism mentality. 
Hate it or love it, that is what it is. And it's great for people who understand this because now you own the businesses, you own the investments that profit when people spend their money. But when you don't understand this, you're the one that's spending all their money, going into debt to make the rest of the country rich at your expense. And that's why it is so important for you to understand this because if you don't understand this, you're the reason why everybody else gets to drive around in the nice cars. You're the reason everybody else gets to fly around in the private jets and fly first class. You're the reason everybody has those nice homes. It's because you keep spending all of your money. It's because you keep going into debt to make other people rich before you make yourself rich. That means, number one, if you have $1,000 in your bank account, you can't go out and spend $1,000. And that means if you have $1,000 in your bank account, you cannot afford a $1,000 jacket. You cannot afford a $1,000 handbag. You cannot afford a $1,000 iPhone. Because there's a difference between being able to afford something and being able to buy something. See, most people assume that if I got $50 in the bank and I want to buy a $1,000 phone and it's a $40 a month payment, I can afford the phone because I can afford the $40 monthly payment. But being able to afford something and being able to make the monthly payments are two completely different things. And now, if you want to be able to actually afford it, that means you got to be able to buy the whole thing without having to finance it. The only exception to this that I would make is the home that you live in. But now, when it comes to buying things like a phone, buying things like a car, buying things like a sofa, buying things like a TV, stop financing it. Buy it with cash. Yes, including that car too. The reason why so many Americans are broke, if you had to just pick one item, it's because of how much money people are spending on their car. More and more Americans now have a $1,000 monthly car payment. I think it was 20% of all Americans who have a car payment have at least a $1,000 a month car payment. That is a whole rent payment for a lot of the country. So now when you're spending $1,000 a month just on the car payment, the next thing you gotta pay for is the expensive gas. The next thing you gotta pay for is the expense of insurance. The next thing you gotta pay for is the expense of oil changes. And then the next thing you gotta pay for is the expense of maintenance on top of all of that. So it's not just a $1,000 a month car payment you gotta pay. Now you're paying $3,000 a month just to keep up with this car. So now if you wanna break out of that, go out and buy a used car with cash. If you were gonna put $8,000 down to go out and finance this nice car, take the eight grand, go out and buy a car with cash. Yeah, it's not as nice, but you don't gotta worry about the payments. Now you take those payments and you reinvest it back into yourself. But then you're gonna say, but just breathe, if I have $1,000 in my bank account, why can't I buy a $1,000 jacket? Or a $1,000 iPhone? Or a $1,000 handbag? I mean, if I have $1,000, I can actually afford it, right? Well, kind of. Yeah, you can buy it. But if you really want to be able to afford it, you can't spend all your money to buy this thing. That's why one of the things I like to follow is a simple rule of five, which says if you cannot buy five of them, you cannot afford one of them. Now, you start to really change the way you think about spending your money. If you got $1,000 in your bank account, that means the most you can buy is a $200 phone, or a $200 jacket, or a $200 handbag. And that way now you're not spending all of your money. It changes the way you think. Now at first you're gonna say, well how the heck am I supposed to afford a lifestyle if I start to live so much smaller? Well, you'll find a way. Because if the government were to tax you tomorrow, impose a brand new 30% tax on your income, what are you gonna do? You're gonna kick, complain, scream, cry, and then you're gonna find a way to pay it. And that's exactly what you gotta do right now, is you gotta find a way in the beginning to live smaller. Now, I'm gonna say this again, the goal is not to live small for the rest of your life. The goal is not to sit there and pinch pennies for the rest of your life. Pinching pennies is never gonna make you wealthy. Because at the end of the day, a penny saved it's just a penny. But you gotta start by understanding how to control your spending before you start worrying about how you can earn more money because if you start earning more money without knowing how to control the spending, well now you end up in a bigger financial hole. And this is what we see happen for so much of America, is people work to get a raise, they work to get a promotion, they work to get a bonus, you make some more money, now you start driving a faster car. You live in a bigger home. You go on a more expensive vacation because you make more money. And this is where you gotta understand why you're working to make more money. Because what wealthy people are doing in this economic system is you're working to make more money to buy more investments. And if you can buy more investments, these investments will continue to make you money because of the way our economic system works. And now if these investments are making you more money, well now you can take the money your investments make and start to use that to live a bigger lifestyle. And this takes time to do. The reason why so many people don't wanna do this is because, well, it's gonna take me a long time to start making any money from my investments. And you're 100% right. That's why I call it a decade of sacrifice. But if you can put in that decade of living smaller and working to earn more money, that way you can invest more aggressively, after a decade, you're gonna have a whole new stream of income. 
maybe a whole new asset that's producing more money for you that you can start using to live a better life. But most people are not willing to put in that time. Most people are not willing to put in that work. Most people are not willing to put in the effort or make those sacrifices. And that's why most people will never become wealthy. And that's why most people will continue to complain and hate the system. Now, the problem with that is that's never going to actually help you with your financial situation. Complaining and hating and bringing everybody else down and bringing down the rest of the world, it's not going to help you feed your family. It's not going to help you take your kids to Disney World. It's not going to help you buy your spouse the handbag that he or she wants. If you want to be able to have the nice things financially, you got to go out and get more money. And that means you got to understand how to use your money smartly. That's the first step. And that means number one, you got to understand how to track your money. Once you can start tracking your money, you make the adjustments, you start implementing and you keep working on this, then you got to figure out how can you control the spending. Once you can figure out how to control the expenses, because now you got the income coming in, you got to control these expenses so you have more money to invest, then is how can you earn more money? And this is where things start to get fun. Because now the question is how do you go from $40,000 a year to $400,000 a year? And at first you might hear that and say, how in the world can somebody like me go from 40 to 400? That doesn't make any sense. But when you start asking that question, you're going to start looking for new answers. Now you're going to start watching different YouTube videos. You're going to start watching YouTube videos on how do you earn more money? How do you start a business? How do you start a side hustle? How can you increase your income? How can you change your career? How can you get a new certificate? And then you can start doing different things. And as you start doing different things, now you're going to start seeing your income change as well. It's not going to happen overnight. This is a process. Remember, a decade of sacrifice is more than just six months. We're talking about a decade of work, effort, time and learning to put in the work, to put in the effort. That way you can start getting the rewards of your effort after putting in the work, after putting in the time. Most people put in the work for six months and say, where's my reward? But you got to keep coming back, putting in the reps and understand now, what are the questions you got to ask? Because once you can control this, then it's all about how can you grow this? And as you grow this, remember, the key is to grow how much money you're putting into your investments. If you can grow how much money you're putting into your investments, you're going to be able to grow how much wealth you will be able to build. And if you can own more assets, then you also get to buy more freedom. Your real estate agent and your mortgage broker, they want you to buy the best home possible, which many times means the most expensive home possible, which also coincidentally means the biggest commission check possible for your real estate agent and your mortgage broker. Your wallet, on the other hand, wants you to buy the smallest home possible because that's going to keep more money in your bank.